Assalamu alaikum and a very good day to everyone. Welcome everybody to our lecture series organized by Faculty of Engineering, University Technology Malaysia, UTM. I'm Sarina Sulaiman and I'm a head of Soft Computing, Soft Computing Research Group, SCRG, School of Computing, and I'm also a research fellow of UTM Big Data Center. Today, we are pleased to welcome Prof. Dr. Christoph Quicks, a very special guest speaker for the Distinguished Lecture Series 34. And he is uh, from Information System and Data Science at the University of Applied Science, Nederheim in Kerfiel, Germany. Today, he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on the data science for industry 4.0. Okay, before we start this session, I would like to express many thanks eh, and appreciations to our former lecturer, Associate Prof. Dr. Tony Anwar, and he is currently a lecturer at University Technology Petronas Malaysia for giving us the opportunity to conduct multiple activities through our networking grant. Digital Lifestyle in collaborations with Aachen University from 2016 to 2019. Through these collaborations, we get to know Prof. Dr. Christoph Quicks. Right. So without further delay, I would like to pass this session to Prof. Rafik, Dean of Faculty. Uh, thank you, Sarina. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, welcome everyone to our 34th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Christoph Quicks from Un University of Applied Sciences, Niederrhein, Germany. I hope I pronounce it correctly. A bit about our presenter today. Christoph Quicks is a professor for information systems and data science at the University of Applied Sciences Niederrhein in Krefeld, Germany. He is also a senior researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Information Technology in St. Augustine, Germany, where he leads the department for high content analysis. Previously, he has been in an interim professor for data science at RWTH Aachen University. His research focuses on data integration, big data, management of heterogeneous data, metadata management, and semantic web technologies in various application areas, such as Industry 4.0 and Life Sciences. He has more than 100 publications in scientific journals and international conferences. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Christoph Quicks from University of Applied Sciences Niederrhein with his talk on data science for Industry 4.0. Professor Christoph Quicks, over to you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, so, um, yeah, good morning or good afternoon for you. Um, also from my side, so I'm, it's my pleasure to present this um, topic here. I hope um, the audio connection is okay. You can hear me clearly. Yes, it, it's perfect. Yeah, okay. And, um, okay, so ah, there are my slides. So, um, yeah, the topic uh, for my talk today is Data Science for Industry 4.0. Um, so I will uh, report on some projects which I have done um, within um, the Fraunhofer Institute uh, within the recent years and also uh, in cooperation with uh, the RWTH Aachen University. Um, and uh, as you can see um, on the slide, uh, there are some uh, people involved here in this project and I also want to acknowledge their support here um, in this um, um, in this research here. So, um, what does it mean, Industry 4.0? Um, so, this is uh, 
uh, a driver for the digital transformation. Um, so we have uh, the digitalization or the digital transformation is uh, happening uh, or is taking place in a lot of um, areas nowadays. Uh, we have it in the industrial area. We have it in um, in, in life sciences, in uh, medicine, and in, in other areas. And um, in the industrial uh, area, um, this term um, Industry 4.0 has been coined uh, about 10 years ago. It's actually a, a German term, yeah, so it has been uh, first introduced in German, um, this term for Industry 4.0. Uh, in an international context, um, one uh, can often hear also the, the term industrial internet of things. And um, so uh, what, what is the meaning of, of this um, term? Yeah. So um, the fourth industrial revolution, yeah, so um, is, is meant by that. Yeah, so what have been the three industrial revolutions before? Yeah, so uh, there have been, um, yeah, more basic things. Um, so at the end of the 18th century, we had the introduction of uh, production ma machines, which were using uh, water or steam power uh, to drive the machines. Then in the early uh, 20th century, we had uh, the introduction of mass production, where we had assembly lines, and um, then using uh, electrical power, um, Yeah, which was uh, the, the very uh, popular example is um, the automobile production in Ford. Yeah, so um, that was um, the, is a classical uh, example for mass production, uh, which was introduced about 100 years ago. And then about 50 years ago, we had um, the increasing use of electronic uh, devices and also uh, IT devices in um, production. Um, it was still very basic, but it was uh, the first also automatic devices, the first kind of robots which were employed um, in, in uh, that time. Yeah? And nowadays, uh, what we are aiming at is um, that the production um, becomes more interconnected so that the individual robots which I have in my production line, um, that they're also communic communicating to each other. Um, maybe they can report about some problems which they have encountered when they were working on their part of the product and communi can communicate that problem also to the, the other devices so that the, they are um, prepared uh, for a problem which might come up. Um, in, in their production uh, process later. Yeah, so uh, communication, data exchange is one important um, uh, thing in that context. And um, the other important uh, aspect is artificial intelligence. Yeah, so um, the uh, machines which we use here, not necessarily only uh, robots which uh, are equipped there, but also uh, classical production machines, any kind. Um, machine which can be controlled by an IT device is, is relevant here. And um, so they should uh, be able um, to uh, work intelligently uh, with some um, yeah, artificial intelligence in the background, which uh, gives the information to that um, machine on how to react, on how to, to work. Yeah, so this is the, the basic idea there. Um, so why is data science uh, relevant for Industry 4.0? It's quite obvious that we have a huge amount of data uh, which is available in these uh, manufacturing processes. Um, so I have been visiting a company yesterday uh, uh, which is working on um, um, production machines for um, making glues or for applying uh, uh, rubbers, um, of, for applying glue on rubbers, yeah. Um, so that's um, what they are doing. And um, they have also um, machines to inspect the, the, um, the products which they produce, yeah. And they do that with a lot of sensor technology and also with cameras, yeah. And when these cameras are 
um, recording um, images and sensor data. They produce uh, quite a lot of data. Um, they are so about one gigabyte per minute. And this um, data um, needs to be continu continuously either be um, directly analyzed so that uh, we can um, control, adapt our production process to what we have um, seen in the uh, production process earlier, or uh, we need to store it for later um, so that we can later do a quality analysis. Yeah. So when uh, later then a customer reports a problem with, uh, with a product, um, then we can check our data to see what happened uh, during the production process um, of that product so that we um, can learn maybe from, um, from the history and uh, thereby improve our production process. So data collection, data analysis, is very important um, for this industry 4.0 um, um, context, yeah? Um, so data science techniques are therefore um, becoming more and more important for manufacturing. And um, so data science is not only applying um, TensorFlow and deep learning or other machine learning techniques, it's also the more uh, basic things um, uh, doing the data management, yeah? So, um, as I said, um, there's a huge amount of data involved in the production processes. And in order to be able to get uh, information out of the data, we first need to manage the data in a proper way. So we need to store it in a, a proper data repository. We need to um, describe this data with uh, metadata so that we know what kind of data uh, we have uh, available and how we can make use of the data. Yeah? And when we, we have the appropriate description, the appropriate metadata for the data, then we can also use it um, effectively in a um, machine learning process. Yeah? So if we don't know our data, if we don't have the information about our uh, data sets, uh, what kind of data is available, then um, applying a machine learning to this data swamp uh, might be uh, very difficult, yeah? And, um, yeah, so a very uh, frequently mentioned um, example um, for, uh, yeah, applying machine learning techniques in um, manufacturing is this predictive maintenance example, yeah, so that we look at the, the sensor data um, of a machine, and um, then uh, we want to predict um, when is the, the best time to replace a specific part of the machine, yeah, so that uh, we prevent a, a failure of the machine. Yeah? Um, this is, of course, a very important use case because um, these uh, maintenance downtimes, they can be very expensive uh, for a company, so therefore it's uh, a good idea to have this predictive maintenance, but there are also many other use cases. Um, yeah, like uh, I said, quality control, um, the right adjustment of the machines, the parameter settings and so on. Um, all this is um, um, important um, or all these are uh, scenarios where we can apply data science techniques um, to improve the uh, uh, production processes. Yeah, so there's, um, that's uh, what I just want to say here, um, that there's more than predictive maintenance in this context. Um, yeah, so um, what I want to point out here in this uh, talk is, um, or are the challenges um, for uh, industry 4.0 from the viewpoint of a computer scientist or a data scientist, yeah? Um, so as I said, one um, Im important issue is the interconnection between the different devices. So the interoperability, the ability to exchange data between different devices in, in the network. Here, yeah? Or what's also important. Um, okay, somehow you can see my laser pointer here. Okay, so... Um, here is um, what's also important is the in-network processing. Yeah, so when we have uh, our 
um, production devices here on the left hand side, yeah, then it might happen that we produce a lot of, of data and it's already uh, a difficulty uh, to transfer this data uh, through the network because there's maybe more data than um, the network is able to transfer. Yeah, so in, in some use cases, we have uh, data rates of 10 gigabit per second. Yeah, and this um, is uh, going beyond the limits of um, a classical gigabit network, for example. And um, therefore, we have to apply um, early uh, data processing te techniques already on the network devices, like a switch or maybe already on the device which produces the data so that we uh, process the data as early as uh, possible and reduce the data um, as, as far as, as possible. Yeah? So this then also um, addresses the points of real-time analysis yeah? so that we um, have to do the, the analysis very close to real-time. This depends, of course, on the specific requirements of the use case. Yeah, so in some use cases, I have more time to do my analysis. Maybe I have a few seconds or even minutes. But uh, when my machine produces uh, 100 items per minute, yeah, then I don't have more than a second um, to react um, to uh, certain issues. Yeah, because then um, more uh, items will be affected by this uh, problem, which might be um, encountered in the data. Okay, to uh, reduce the complexity of, um, of data analysis, so this data reduction is very important. It's also important, as I said, for the uh, transmission of the data within the network. Um, what we also have to consider is the interorganizational data exchange. Yeah, um, so today uh, we have um, supply chains which are, which are uh, closely connected, um, yeah, so that. Uh, it's important also to get um, production information, production data uh, from our suppliers or that we uh, supply that data to our customers um, so that there is an interchange um, between these, um, uh, or that, that there is a data exchange between these different companies. And so this goes also across companies' borders and um, the special. Um, Challenge here is that we also want to um, make sure that there is still some privacy, yeah, because the, the company uh, does not want to reveal all the data um, to their um, partners, but only a certain part of that, yeah. And um, this is then also important um, to, um, uh, to develop concepts uh, for these problems. Yeah, and then we have um, a lot of uh, engineering experience, uh, which are represented in mathematical models, in engineering models, which have been developed for the last decades or for the last centuries already. Yeah, and now we are um, producing or um, computing new models, uh, these data-driven models, which might be also mathematical models, yeah, but um, they are somehow different. Yeah, and now the question is, how can we integrate the, the classical knowledge which we have from engineering from the past decades? Um, how can we integrate that with the, um, the new models, uh, the data-driven models, which we have computed by our machine learning um, techniques and so on? Yeah, so this is then also um, a challenge there. Yeah, so um, as I said before, uh, we are addressing uh, these issues in two national research projects. Um, the one is um, the Internet of Production, which is a cluster of excellence at the RWTH Aachen University. Um, also Fraunhofer is involved there in this cluster. And um, so this is um, yeah, a larger interdisciplinary uh, project at the university with about 100 researchers involved in that project. And um, we have also uh, quite a long funding period there for seven years, um, so which gives us really the opportunity um, to do some basic research in that area. 
And the other project is at uh, Fraunhofer called Evolo Pro. So uh, Evolo, the name um, is derived from uh, evolutionary algorithms, which should be applied um, for production um, there. And um, so this is also a lighthouse project, which means that we are also looking a little bit more into basic research there. Uh, but as from for is doing it usually we are also in um, going into the application so it's not only basic research but also application uh, applying the the results the research results um, into some real industrial projects there yeah so um, basically the things which I wanted uh, to discuss here um, are from these two research projects and um, so the rest of the talk will be structured as follows. So I will um, talk, uh, start with a little bit discussion about digital twins, uh, which is a very important um, concept for industry 4.0. Um, then I will uh, briefly introduce the maturity model for digital twins, which we have developed uh, at Fraunhofer, and then uh, discuss about digital shadows um, then, um, which is the main concept which we have developed in this cluster of excellence, Internet of Production. Um, then, and then finally, um, conclude with some uh, challenges uh, which are which still have to be addressed in this um, context. Um, okay, so what what is a digital twin? So when uh, we look at um, uh, the literature, so there are many different uh, definitions of a digital twin. Yeah, so if we look at this um, definition um, yeah, from a more abstract point of view, so what we want to represent is uh, a real object. Yeah, so here we have a blisk. Yeah, so this is um, um, yeah a, a wheel which is um, used within um, airplane engines, and um, so. Of this BLISC, um, we can have some um, uh, digital representation. Yeah, of course, we, we would have a perfect uh, digital representation which would represent all the details of this real object in some digital way. Yeah, so this would be then the, um, the perfect digital twin. Yeah, so which is complete and correct in all uh, aspects which we could uh, think of. Yeah? But of course, um, the real digital twin um, is uh, not complete and might also uh, contain incorrect data because um, the measurements are not correct. And um, it's also incomplete because we do not record all, all the, the aspects. Yeah? So we do not transform all the, the issues of the, this um, real object into our um, a digital model, yeah, because our digital model is an abstraction, it's a reduction of the, the real object, yeah, so this is the, the usual thing which we are doing as a computer scientist is that we abstract from the concrete object and by abstraction we are using, uh, we are also losing um, information, yeah, so that um, some details are not uh, represented in our digital representation. And um, then um, what we do then is also some kind of interpretation of this digital representation, um, which we then use for our uh, specific applications. Yeah, um, whatever we would like to do with that um, data. Maybe we want to do a simulation. Yeah, so to see what happens when we change some aspect of this list. Yeah, so we. Um, maybe change the rotation speed or whatever, yeah? And um, then we want to see in the simulation uh, what is the, the um, result uh, of that, yeah? Or we want to compute some other um, issues of that um, uh, thing which we have there, yeah? But we do that on the digital representation. And um, so, we always have to take into account that there is um, that this is only a digital representation, so there might be some loss 
uh, of information here. Yeah. So what we uh, the, the result for, of uh, our simulation is uh, might be correct in 99% uh, of the cases, but there might be also some cases where our result is not correct because it's only an approximation. So and this is uh, what we have to take into account. Um, okay, so when we um, look here at this uh, representation of the digital twin, uh, we can see, um, okay, we have to collect a lot of data um, for this digital twin representation. Yeah, so the, the zeros and ones here, there are some uh, data, it's, it's some data set uh, which we have collected here. Yeah, and um, so therefore it's somehow uh, natural to see the digital twin at the first place as a data repository. Yeah, so um, uh, we um, need to collect information about the components of the real object. Yeah? So what are the individual parts which we have there? What are the processes which have been used to produce that um, component? Uh, which materials have been used? Maybe we have um, some um, uh, raw materials which are used there. And there we also have some, some data about these materials which we have used. There. Then we, we might have um, uh, data about the um, final product, yeah. So not only um, the 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 data from the quality assurance, but maybe also when the product is really in use, so that we get data uh, while the product is in use, and that we also uh, collect that data. Yeah? So we get uh, data from uh, different aspects, and we get it uh, also data in many different uh, data formats, uh, different uh, structures. Yeah, so we have CAD drawings, yeah, uh, which is somehow the, the plan of what should be uh, constructed. We have the simulation data, we have sensor data. Uh, we can have a lot of different um, data structures um, here. Yeah, and the, the first challenge is to collect all that data um, so that. Um, when we want to know something about our product um, or about our production processes, that we can access that um, data and um, apply it in a machine learning process or do some other kind of data analysis on um, based on this data. So this is um, the, the first issue uh, which we need to, um, to solve. Uh, but it's difficult to capture all the data within one integrated repository to have really one integrated data model for that because the data is very heterogeneous. Yeah, so when you see the different data types there, CD drawings and sensor data, yeah, so there are um, from the level of granularity and um, detail uh, very um, heterogeneous. Yeah, um, so there's also the problem of scalability. Um, so that uh, we have, um, we, we need to um, handle a large amount of data here. And also velocity is a problem, um, meaning that the data is produced at a high rate. As said before, there might be uh, cameras involved there producing data at one gigabit or one, uh, 10 gigabit per second. Yeah? And then uh, we need to be able to process this data very um, so one of the first things which we proposed um, to realize um, a digital twin is then um, a data lake system and um, which should act as um, the repository, the data repository where we collect all the data, all the relevant data uh, then um, in, in one repository so that we have it in, in one place. And then we can use um, classical metadata management uh, techniques to enrich that information there so that we uh, can describe the data which is in that repository so that we can make, later make uh, also use of that. Yeah, and this is already uh, very useful for the engineers because they are um, often working only file-based. Yeah, so they are exchanging files with um, a lot of sensor data or, um, uh, uh, CAD drawings or simulation data. Yeah, this is always maintained um, in files, um, and um, so 
they did not yet have the, the understanding of putting a proper data management framework around it. Yeah? And um, so therefore, having a, a data lake infrastructure is for them already a benefit. Yeah? And then we can apply on this uh, data sets, uh, which we have on the data lake, uh, we can apply our uh, big data systems, um, such as Hadoop, Spark, and so on, to do data transformation and cleaning. We can um, do some aggregation, integration of the data set, and maybe also some machine learning um, can be applied on, on top of these um, data sets. This is um, what we uh, also currently are uh, developing in uh, one of our projects. Um, so in this Evolo Pro project, where it's classical data management um, business, what we are doing there. So we have in the back end, we have um, several big data systems, which you are using here. Um, you can see Spark. We have the Hadoop systems, Hive and HBase here. We have Kafka for the... Um, stream processing, uh, Storm also, and maybe also some other systems to handle heterogeneous data. And then we uh, built a classical um, REST-based, web-based um, application architecture, um, which we um, then can use to insert data into this data lake um, to uh, manage the metadata um, and also to provide the data then um, to the clients here. And what is currently a little bit, the, um, the, yes, somehow the research challenge for us is um, to uh, get away a little bit from this file-based um, working style of the engineers. Yeah? So that can, so currently the, the um, access here is very simple. So they want to put a file into this repository and they want to get back the file from the repository. We want to have a, more, uh, a deeper understanding of the data there um, so that we can really look into the files and maybe then um, do data integration in, um, in the content of the file. So this is um, one important aspect. Of course, uh, uh, access rights is also an important issue here. And, um, so not everybody is allowed to see um, all the information. So therefore, uh, we also have an authorization mechanism. Um, so the next point which I want to talk about is about the maturity model for digital twins. And um, so the point here is that um, a digital twins should provide more functionality than just um, the data management. Yeah? But um, there are actually many different um, understandings of what a digital twin should uh, provide. Yeah? Of course, it should provide somehow integration of data, but um, some people think, okay, it should be also able to optimize something with respect to some um, uh, function. Yeah? It should be also able to simulate something. Yeah? It should be able to apply machine learning algorithms artificial intelligence. Yeah, so there are many different understandings of what a digital twin um, should offer. Yeah? And to um, resolve that problem, um, we have developed um, um, yeah, this maturity model, a multi-level maturity model um, to say, okay, maybe you are all talking about the same thing, yeah, but you are talking about the same thing at different levels. Yeah, so some people think um, for them a digital twin, which just is um, a data lake and collects the data from the different aspects, um, is enough. Yeah, and then they are talking about the digital twin at level zero. Yeah, so which we have defined. And when we want to have more integration, then we um, should have um, also models involved here. Models in um, in terms of describing the data, yeah, so that we uh, describe the data by a formal model like um, a UML, a conceptual model, or an ontology, um, and um, that we know also our data sources, so, so that we can um, describe the content of the data sources by these models. Then, um, 
The next level is about integration, yeah, so that we collect all this information really in a central repository that we are able to link the data within this uh, repo uh, repository and um, that this data is always um, accessible there. And also derived results um, should be stored in that repository. And then the, the final level, uh, which we consider here uh, currently is then the, um, the optimization so that there's also some intelligence within the uh, digital twin so that it can optimize um, the, the production process uh, with respect to something. And uh, when it's able to optimize, then there should be also a bi-directional data flow. Yeah? So it's um, up to level two, it's only that we collect the data from the real object within the digital twin. And the final level is also then the feedback loop uh, from the digital twin to the real object so that we can somehow control, steer the, the real object or the, the real uh, production pro processes there. And um, so that we can make use of the, the optimization results. And um, then also analytical models um, should be integrated in that um, context. Um, so this is um, just one aspect of um, the um, digital twin here. And the, the final aspect which I want to introduce here is the term of digital uh, shadow. Yeah? Because when we were looking a little bit uh, more closely at the, the term digital twin, we thought that itself is misleading. Yeah? Um, as we have seen, have seen earlier, so the, the digital twin is not really a twin. Yeah? It's not really an exact copy of the real object because we have incomplete and maybe incorrect information within our digital twin. Yeah? So there's also uh, a loss of information involved there. Yeah? And this is because of the, the abstraction which we do when we uh, digitalize something, yeah? because there's always abstraction involved. We reduce the amount of data. We, we have an abstract representation, which is this model of, of something, yeah, which is all always somehow a, a simplification um, of of the real object. Yeah? So this is the purpose of a model, um, so that that somehow simpler as the real object. Yeah? And um, so therefore, the term twin is really uh, misleading. Yeah? And um, so in this uh, cluster of excellence, um, Internet of Production, we are using the term digital shadow to emphasize this. Um, way of um, data reduction and abstraction. And we also uh, we emphasize that also because this reduction is really necessary to be able to handle the data. Yeah? Because we have so much data which we have to process there so that we cannot really uh, process all the data um, uh, which is available, but we have to apply these uh, reduction and abstraction. Yeah, and so the idea is basically shown here in this um, diagram. Yeah, so we have um, our uh, real object. Yeah, so which is indicated here by our factory. Yeah, so we have some different viewpoints, and uh, these viewpoints they create um, shadows. Yeah, and so we might have different shadows for different viewpoints. Yeah, so in some cases I'm more interested maybe in the energy consumption. And in, in another case, I'm more interested in um, the stability of the product. Um, and for each of these uh, viewpoints, I have different digital um, shadows. Yeah? And these di digital shadows are put into the data lake. And the data lake um, is then um, can be used to create uh, digital twins. Yeah? So um, the data from the data lake um, can be then used to uh, produce digital twins. But as I said, we are aware of the problem so that the digital twin is incomplete and um, might have also incorrect uh, data in there. And um, here from this digital twin, then we also have the, um, this feedback connection to the uh, real object so that we can configure this or control this in, in some way. 
And also the analysis results, um, yeah, they can uh, be um, integrated also later into the data lake. So this is the um, idea of the digital people. So this uh, figure here is a more detailed, more technical architecture of what we envision there. So as I said, so we have uh, the real um, systems which um, produce the, um, the data. Yeah, so there we have the data streams. They um, get into the data lake and from the data lake, we um, produce the, the shadows which are um, then relevant for some aspect yeah, by reducing by aggregation um, the, the data and um, then um, the digital twin is actually made out of a multiple of these um, digital shadows. Yeah? So there's not only one um, digital shadow for each digital twin, but um, there are multiple shadows. Yeah? So different viewpoints, different perspectives, which are um, considered in this twin because the twin is responsible for controlling um, the production process and maybe it should consider different perspectives uh, in this uh, uh, control process, in this configuration process. Yeah, so this is uh, very important. Okay, so um, I think I need to come to the end of my presentation. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, so there are still a lot of um, open research uh, topics um, for computer scientists in this area. Um, so, um, first of all, there is the way of how should we interact with this digital twin or digital shadow. Yeah? So, we need to have some smart human interfaces to um, really work with this um, um, digital twin. Yeah? So nowadays I have the impression that we one needs to be a programmer to be able to interact with um, the digital twin yeah? and or needs to have really a deep understanding of data science techniques to be able to work with the data. And this has to be improved so that also um, non-IT experts can work with this uh, digital twin. Burden-free operation means that um, it should not be too complicated to set up such an infrastructure, um, to set up the digital twin and also to interact with it. it then we have to apply um, the arti uh, artificial intelligence methods um, there and um, also to interconnect the domain knowledge. That's what I said earlier. So how can we integrate the, the classical engineering models with the um, AI methods, the AI models which we have uh, learned there. And um, what I have uh, focused here on my talk are the different aspects of data management here, um, which are the, the integration um, problems there. Yeah, so how do we integrate data within our data lake, but how do we integrate that also with the real world? Yeah, so how do we build connections to the um, real object there? So that our digital twin, our digital shadow is a more complete and more correct representation of the, the real object. Long-term information usage is uh, important there um, so that um, we can use the data for a longer time. Yeah, so the, the, um, the engineering cycles, they are going for um, many years maybe and um, maybe slower than um, our IT uh, cycles, yeah. And um, when we um, deploy new big data systems, new database systems, um, then we should make sh sure that the information which is contained in our uh, previous systems that this is also available in the, in the newer systems, yeah. And um, standardized data interfaces is um, also an important aspect. In, order to enable the data exchange, the interoperability, and um, yeah, also um, maybe it's not the solution to work on standardized interfaces, but to more work on um, mechanisms to uh, be able to transform the data between different um, representations, between different moments. 
Okay, um, so conclusion. Yeah, so we have seen um, the basic points of digital twins. Um, so nowadays, digital twins is a frequently used buzzword uh, with many different meanings, uh, different interpretations. And um, with the maturity model, we want to outline somehow an evolutionary process to realize um, a full digital twin. And um, this should also outline um, a development process within a company. Um, what are the steps which are necessary to, um, to realize a digital twin for a production process, for example. Um, we have seen uh, the digital shadows, um, yeah, which are the data traces um, for different viewpoints, for different um, observations of the real object. Um, we can use data lakes in this context here to uh, manage the heterogeneous data of twins and shadows. And uh, we have seen uh, that there are still many research challenges um, for twins and shadows in this context. So I thank you for your attention and I'm open now for questions. All right. Many thanks, Prof, for your fruitful and informative talk. And now we would like to open a question and answer ses sessions, right? Uh, I believe there is a question from our participants today, uh, but I start with my question first. Is it okay, Prof. Krista? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. I have a general question. Um, what is the difference between data lake versus data warehouse versus data mart versus database? Could you differentiate between this kind of data? If possible, could you give us different examples? for each type of data? Um, to check. Okay. Um, so can you see my slides? Oh, ah, okay. Uh, so, it's okay, uh, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. I can see. Um, maybe um, it's uh, easier to explain when we look at that slide here. Uh -huh. um, so the, the difference between data lake and data warehouse is basically um, the um, so there's my pointer here. So here we have the, the transformation layer um, mm -hmm. in the data lake, which is on top of the uh, storage layer. Yeah? And um, so that means that in a data lake, we first put the data into the data lake without uh, applying any transformation. So we copy as it is into the data lake, which is also important in this industrial context, yeah, because we maybe we are not able um, to somehow transform the data into a uniform representation. We just want to put it first into a, a repository so that we are able to access the data. And mm -hmm. then in the second stage, we um, will apply the transformation then when we know that the data which is available there is somehow of interest for us. Mm -hmm. In the data warehouse, I do it the other way around. So I first apply the uh, transformation steps mm -hmm. to clean the data, to integrate the data, and then put it into the data warehouse. Okay. And, um, so this is the, the main difference. Yeah? And right. because of this difference, the data lake is more flexible in terms of data sources. Yeah? So I, basically I can put uh, any kind of data source, any kind of data set within my data lake. Mm -hmm. And um, in the data warehouse, it's more complicated to integrate a new data source. Into it. Okay. And the data marts are also relevant um, in both architectures. I have data marts in the data warehouse. I have mm -hmm. also data marts in my data lake architecture here on the transformation layer, because mm -hmm. they are basically the result of a transformation. So I do a, a data transformation here in the data lake for a specific application. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, for that, I create a data mark. Yeah? So which is a small integrated uh, data set um, for a specific application. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, thank you for your explanations, right? So actually, uh, I have another question. Okay, we have 
questions from uh, our audience here okay uh, from our participants okay the questions from alia serenity rana sodomo okay the question is how to overcome the problem in the suburban area with not much facilities um With not much facilities, what kind of facilities? Okay, I'm not sure, Barry. Uh, maybe you can guess any facilities. I'm not sure what kind of. Uh, maybe, maybe just because this one is suburban area, so maybe any any facilities, any facilities. Uh -huh. So you're not sure. Not a problem in the suburban and with not much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, continue the the question. This is we facing nowadays. I'm not sure. Um. Okay. So what I understand it's mm -hmm. also a problem what we have here in Germany that we are in in uh, uh, urban areas. Um. Uh, no. In, in, Suburban areas, uh, we have um, not so much connectivity. Yeah, so we have pro problems with our internet connections. Or we um, also the the smaller companies they don't do not have the facilities in terms of um, data management. There, um, yeah. So this is a good question on how to address that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think. Um, well, to start with, um, the the companies they do not really need to have a, a gigabit connection um, to the cloud here, yeah, so that they can um, put um, all their stuff into the Amazon cloud. Yeah. So anyway, many companies don't want to do that. Um, it would be already uh, sufficient if they would um, start with a small server uh, which is able to collect the data. Um, in their local environment and mm -hmm. um, so that they are um, collecting the data and so that the data is available, is accessible for later analysis. So this is important. So there's not always um, uh, the necessity to have um, yeah, uh, high uh, interconnection, internet connections uh, with high bandwidth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, the next uh, the next question. Okay, okay, alias uh, Serenity Renel Sedeman. So she meant she mentioned about for for an example, the internet speed too slow due to the cable the cable that used in is not fiber optics. Mm -hmm. Maybe the one is one of the reason why. Uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, what, what I also just said. So um, it's not necessary uh, that we do all this data processing in the cloud. Uh, yeah. We can already start with very simple machines, um, low cost environment uh, within the local um, factory, within the local site. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then we must have somehow the, the IT stuff around which is able to manage these um, servers, this equipment. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. So in within um, the life science context, we have uh, we had the idea of giving them um, small uh, bare bone machines um, with um, which had some. Uh, yeah, pre-configured uh, software installed on that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they just, uh, which just provides a web interface as I've uh, shown it in my presentation. So a simple web application where the, the users are able to um, um, upload uh, data sets and then also have a query interface to um, uh, query the data, to search for data sets and so on. And this can be already established with a, a small um, a low cost uh, local machine also. All right. Okay, okay, Prof. Uh, this is my questions. Actually, 
what is the difference between data science and data analytics? Are they use the same methodology or different methodology? Um, between data science and data analytics? Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I see data analytics as part of, of uh, data science. Yeah, so yeah. Um, data science um, includes also other um, issues such as um, data management. Yeah, so the data preparation phase, um, for example, um, data integration. So this is um, for me also part of data science and mm -hmm. data analytics is then really only the part which applies machine learning um, mm -hmm. um, algorithms then on the data. And so, mm -hmm. All right. Idea. So, okay. Uh, I have another question. Okay. If you have uh, 40 gigabyte RAM in your machine and you want to train uh, your model on 10 gigabyte data, data set, how will you go about this problem? Have you ever faced this kind of problem in your machine learning or data science experience so far? Uh, I have four gigabyte of RAM and want to train it on 10 gigabyte of data. Uh -huh. Is it okay or not okay? Especially while we use pipe, for example, if we use um, uh, Hadoop, for example, so there is a specific uh, requirement is, is it right? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so usually we, we need to have more uh, we need to have more uh, memory available. Um, mm -hmm. I always say uh, main memory is cannot be replaced by anything. yeah so if you want to have a performant uh, data management server or data science server, then you should look for a lot of main memory. Um, mm -hmm. And um, well, this is always a case by case decision then um, what to do if um, I have not enough uh, memory available. Maybe I can use mm -hmm. sampling to reduce the data set size. Um, maybe mm -hmm. I can uh, do some other kind of aggregation um, in my data mm -hmm. set to reduce the data set um, the, or the data size. Um, I can try to remove the uh, some features which are maybe less relevant. So uh, many different ways on um, trying to reduce the, the data size. Um, and um, so in the end, that means that the data preparation process becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more complex uh, because of this these limitations. All right. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last question, Prof. Uh, from Shaza Iziani Ahmad, I am a newbie in data science and I have a question. You mentioned just now that in data lake, the data is put as it is. So is it possible to also include qualitative, qualitative data in the data lake? Yeah, so you can put any kind of data into the data lake. Um, mm -hmm. So qualitative data, so I know that from social science, like uh, results from interviews, um, for example, of course you can put that also into the data lake. The data lake is not limited to um, um, quantitative data, numeric data. So any kind of data can be put there, especially also unstructured data, um, mm -hmm. text data can be put there. And then the idea is that later on you use some um, transformation process, some analysis process to get some meaning out of the data which you have in your data lake. So there is no restriction there. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, I think uh, we have to stop this session. Uh, and I would like to say a big thanks to Prof. Stop for your willingness to share your lecture series. I hope mm -hmm. we will yes I hope we will have a further collaborations of our research in the mm -hmm. future and then finally um, I will pass over the session to Profit to close up this session thank you Sarina for chairing the session and uh, thank you for introducing uh, Christoph Quicks to me
and to Professor Christoph Hicks, thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to uh, talk at our UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, the topic of uh, Industry 4.0, it is actually very close to our heart. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the reason why uh, to all of you uh, watching this uh, webinar, uh, in UTM, we merge all our engineering faculties as well as the Faculty of Computing under the banner of Faculty of Engineering. The reason why is because we want to revamp our education, our syllabus, our curriculum, to ensure that our engineering graduates are fully equipped to face the future of Industry 4.0. So the topic is extremely relevant, and uh, it is uh, what we are aiming for uh, in this uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0. So Professor Christoph Fix, thank you so very much uh, for a very insightful lecture. And to all of you watching this webinar, thank you for watching. And uh, do stay tuned because we have many more Distinguished Lecture Series in the future. Until then, bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.